Welcome to our spring uh, 2020 data protection update. Um, a number of you will be familiar with this event, uh, which usually they have in their offices. Um, we're obviously doing it uh, by webinar today. And uh, you've got me, Martin Sloan, um, partner in the IP technology and uh, data team at Brodies, and I'll be presenting alongside Grant Campbell, um, one of my fellow partners in the team. So what are we going to cover today? Uh, well, first of all, we're kicking off with looking at data protection and COVID-19 um, and looking at a couple of issues there. So what's the regulator saying? What should you be thinking about? Uh, then looking at uh, something which has become a bit of a hot topic in the last couple of weeks, which is using contact tracing apps and workplace testing and some of the data protection issues to think about with that. I'll, I will then move on to looking at some key cases over the last six months. So I'll start off looking at uh, the latest in um, the Dawson Damer case, and then I hand over to Grant to talk about the Morrison's case on vicarious liability and uh, where we are with the ongoing litigation in the European courts on the uh, Mr. Schrems and standard contractual clauses. Grant will then look at some recent uh, developments with the Information Commissioner in terms of new guidance that's come out and some other developments. Uh, I will then look at a couple of um, enforcement actions, both within the UK, but also elsewhere in, in Europe, which are, are relevant. And we'll then finish up with our usual uh, look to see what's on the horizon coming down the track uh, and take your, your questions. Okay, so going to uh, data protection and COVID-19. So uh, I suppose the first thing to look at is to um, the, the Information Commissioner's approach to this. So they have issued a number of updates over the last few weeks um, to give some guidance to organisations. I suppose that the first thing is you know, they, they remain an independent regulator. They are still doing what they need to do, but they themselves are, are um, encountering difficulties in current times as well in terms of resourcing. And, and one of the things which has um, been affected by that, for example, is the ongoing investigation into ad tech and real-time bidding. So. The ICO has been doing a lot of work with that over the last year or so. Um, it had given the, the industry a bit of a warning, said it needs to do stuff. Um, but we've just heard in the last couple of weeks that effectively that investigation has been parked um, effectively until the ICO has time to pick it up again. And how, what, how does that impact on what um, organisations are doing in terms of regulators' approach? Well, the ICO is still, still focused on the rights of individuals. Um, they are still focused on on doing what they are they are here to do, but they they do recognise that COVID nineteen is having a significant impact on organisations, whether they are in the public sector, private sector, or or the third sector. So they will take that into account, and, and there may be some some leniency or, or some um, understanding in terms of issues of non compliance. But you know, I think that only goes so far. So they they will still accept, expect reports. Uh, beach days to be reported as soon as possible, remembering the 72 hour deadline. Um, they will still expect, expect subject access requests to be responded to, but they do recognise that there may be some delays if people are unable to be in the office, they're unable to inspect records, there are staffing issues or, or whatever. Um, and they will, you know, they, they understand that organisations will need to prioritise in some way. But as I say, it, I think there, the, the, the understanding will, will only go so far. So if we, if we move on to look at um, what organisations should be doing at the moment, then I think one of the key things to look at is, you know, a, a lot of organisations moved very, very quickly to working remotely, having people working at home, and didn't have time to think about changes to policies and procedures to enable that. And, and the ISO acknowledges that that, that is a factor, but that, as I say, I think as, as time goes on, their um, understanding around policies and procedures not being up to date will, will, um, will taper a wee bit. And actually, the, the ICO was tweeted in about the last hour this morning exactly that point, which is now is the time to be reviewing your policies and procedures. If you've got a lot of people working remotely, look at what they're, what they're doing and how, um, whether your, your policies and procedures are, are up to date. So some of the key issues in that, um, we've seen a rapid rollout in, in new technology within organisations. Um, there may be a mismatch between what individuals are doing and what the policies expect them to do. So your, your remote working policies may envisage just a small number of staff doing certain tasks remotely, whereas actually you've got staff doing everything remotely now. And your policies and procedures may not actually, actually reflect that. We know that lots of organisations are, are having uh, staff using non-approved communication platforms, you know, whether it's using Zoom for meetings or some other communication channel, 
staff are finding their own way around to do stuff to, to make their, their life a bit easier. And it may be that your, your internal policy and procedures on, on using technology that doesn't actually reflect um, what you know your staff are actually doing. So look at what they're doing, find out what, what your staff are doing, look at whether you can provide an approved way of doing that or guidance on what people should be doing just to mitigate some of the, the security risks that, that arise through that. Similarly, I suspect there's, there's a market increase in people using using their own devices for, for work purposes as well, and you may or may not have a policy that deals with that. Smart speakers, um, again, another topical issue, you know, if people are remote working, do they have a, an Alexa or a, a Google Home device sitting in, in the room they're working in? Is it perhaps picking up on uh, conversations that are being had and recording them? Is that a, a security issue for you? It'll depend on the organisation as to how much you're, you're concerned by that. But, but do just bear in mind that the working environment is is quite different to being in a in a conventional office or, or um, a building. And also, you know, if you've got people who are printing stuff at home, what, what are they doing with all the paper they create? You know, are you, are you giving them help to uh, work out how that should be shredded or destroyed? Um, are they just to bring it in when they return to, to work? You know, what, what will happen with it? And how secure is the dining table? You know, if you've got people who don't have a dedicated home working space, but they are sharing it with their their partner or another member of their household. You know, are there are there security issues with that? You need to provide your your staff with some guidance on that. And the other thing we're seeing um, moving away from from security. Uh, obviously, organisations are starting to collect uh, data on the health of their employees. They may be getting questions from health authorities and others, and it's important that those are are responded to properly. But also that you understand what you're being asked to provide, and whether you can actually hand that information on over and that that can be quite a tricky one to work out you know if you get a request in relation to a particular employee and their movements or who they've interacted with how do you how do you decide what what you provide so just make sure you're on top of on top of that and thinking about what what information you might share so key actions for just now as i say i think now you know we're, we are eight weeks into this uh, now is a, a good time to review what your staff are actually doing the technology they're using the new technology you've rolled out and making sure that everything is is up to date consider additional guidance if if that is necessary and helpful to staff you know look at the questions you're getting and see if you can, can help them with that review your internal policies and procedures home working policies security policies all that kind of stuff should should have a review just to make sure that they are fit for purpose and consider if there's anything you can do in terms of specific training for for staff so can you provide them with additional training on on data protection and security and managing the personal data that they are they're handling in the course of um, working from home over the next few months. There's a link there in the slides to um, our COVID-19 and data protection page on our on the Brodie's COVID-19 hub, which brings all this together. Um, do have a look at that when you get a chance. Okay, so moving on to the next issue, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but um, contact tracing apps have obviously had a lot of press over um, the last few weeks and there uh, is lots of discussion as to whether you, know, you should be using a uh, our government should be using a centralized model as is the current proposal from uh, the uk government or whether a decentralized model using the apis that have been jointly developed by google and apple should be used i say i'm not going to go into this in detail because this is primarily an issue for um, national governments because they are the ones that are generally doing these sorts of apps it's not you know if these apps are to work, then you need to have one app per country or even or even uh, one app over a wider uh, wider uh, geographic area in order for them to be effective. But you know, it, the, the ICO and others have been making the point that there are privacy issues with these, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of how they're structured, what data is collected, how that's shared, um, and some of the challenges with a, with a centralized model. Um, and carrying out a data protection impact assessment is, is absolutely key here in terms of uh, providing, um, you know, ensuring that, that it's done in a, a compliant manner. The, the NHS published their DPI uh, earlier this week um, and it provides some of the answers, but, but not all of them. But uh, say, just keep an eye on that in terms of how it develops. A bit closer to home, if we, if we move on um, to the next point, I suppose, this is something that we've seen a number of clients ask questions about in, in recent weeks. So as organisations are looking at how they reopen workplaces or how they deal with social distancing and, and other requirements um, within the workplace, um, they are looking to see what sort of testing they can do. And I think using uh, COVID-19 testing, 
you know, whether that's a test or whether you actually have the virus or whether that's um, some other form of testing may well form a key part of a number of organizations' plans. But again, there are a number of data protection issues that organizations need to think about. So, so firstly, on proportionality, so any, any testing that you decide to implement within your organization needs to be proportionate. So you need to think about whether who you're testing and whether that is appropriate and how that testing is done. You need a legal basis for that testing. And remember, because this is going to be special category personal data, you need a, um, an Article 9 condition under GDPR. So you'll be most likely looking at Schedule 1 of the Data Protection Act 2018 and the conditions in relation to processing for employment purposes. But it, I think you need to also think about which groups are in scope. So it may not be appropriate to carry out testing on all employees if, if there's no obvious benefit to doing that. It may be you just identify particular groups. And it, is that testing going to be mandatory or is it going to be voluntary? And that then takes us into issues of employment law and health and safety law. So developing into, uh, an approach to this an internal policy will require input from employment, health and safety and, and data protection as well. So you, you have a, a joined up approach. How we deal with agency staff and contractors and third parties that come on site, it's much easier to deal with with your own direct employees. Um, there may be some additional complications if you are uh, dealing with um, external staff or, or contractors who come in to, to do work on your site. What information are you collecting? Who are you sharing it with? Who has access to it? You, know, you, you may look at this information the same way you look at occupational health data that you hold within your organization and try and ring fence it in some way. But it's absolutely clear here. You need to be clear with employees around who has access and what's what's being done with that because there may be some um yeah, some sensitivity with that. Is your testing done in-house or with a third party? If it's a third party, you want to look at your contractual arrangements for that. And as I say, having having a um privacy notice to cover this is, is key, whether that's in your standard worker notice or whether you use a just-in-time notice to cover testing. So a lot, lots of issues to think about with this. Um, your employee engagement is key uh, in terms of getting employees on board and understanding the benefit of it. If you have unions, then you know, engaging with unions as well will be key to actually um, implementing a successful plan here. And it, the, the most important thing you know, in terms of being able to document your compliance, carry out a data protection impact assessment you know, to identify the risks, to document what, your, what those issues are, what your legal basis is and the steps you're taking to mitigate those risks. This is, uh, given the nature of the, the processing, is something where um, you will need to have a DPIA and you will uh, want to be able to show that to the regulator or anyone else if a question is asked on, on what you're doing. The, I'd say that the ICO has um, published some guidance, which uh, came, I think it was yesterday morning, um, on workplace testing, and there's a link there on the slides to that. And again, if you go to the data protection page on our COVID-19 hub, you'll, you'll see the, um, the uh, guidance that we, we published last week on, on workplace testing as well. Okay, so moving on to key, key case updates. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to take the first one of these, um, which is on Dawson Damer, and then I'll hand over to Grant, who will take you through the next couple. So those of you who were with us in November 19 um, in our updates then will remember that the, the High Court um, had just published its uh, decision um, in Dawson Damer. And th this is a, a litigation that's been going on for well, six years now um, on various issues. And it's all to do with a um, subject access request that was submitted by beneficiaries under a trust to Taylor Wessing, um, which is a, a law firm um, who were acting for the, the trust. <coughs> Excuse me. And there were various issues around whether or not Taylor Wessing um, had to comply with that uh, subject access request. Um, a lot of litigation was on uh, legal professional privilege, which I, I'm not going to go into today. But uh, one of the issues and the one which is, is still rumbling on is around um, paper records and relevant filing systems. So for most organisations, if, if you're not a, a public sector body, then relevant uh, paper records are only in scope for a subject access request if they form part of a, a relevant filing system. And the question that the court was, going to, uh, was looking at is whether Taylor Wessing's uh, paper files, it reacted for this trust for a number of years, um, constituted a relevant filing system and therefore whether uh, Taylor Wessing had to review those paper files um, in order to identify any personal data that may be disclosable under the subject access request. So last year in the, in the High Court, uh, the, 
the, the court looked at this issue and they, they looked at some guidance from the, the Information Commissioner back in 2011, which applied what was called a temp test and said that um, determining whether or not um, something's part of a relevant filing system depends on whether it's readily accessible. And you can assess read, whether it's readily accessible by considering whether a temporary administrative assistant would be able to extract specific information about an individual from the records without any particular knowledge uh, of the type of work or, or documents in issue. And the judge in High Court case said you know, that Taylor Westing had done had looked at some initial files. They hadn't looked at all of them, but he'd started looking at some of them and said, well, you know, they were able to do that. They were able to go through it. It was a, a trainee and, and an um, associate that looked at the files and they had identified some information in those files. So in that case, it was readily accessible. Um, and the, the judge's view in that case is that going through 35 paper files arranged in chronological order was not unduly onerous. So Taylor Westing appealed in that, and we got the decision in March of this year, and the Court of Appeals said, no, the, the High Court got this wrong. So they said, yeah, the initial searches were carried out by the trainee and the associate, um, but if a search requires trained lawyers to page turn and review material, then it's not readily accessible. And they went back to the um, 2011 guidance and, and the, temp, uh, you know, the reasonably competent temp test. And what, what the, the Court of Appeal said is that the, the judge had lost sight of the, the need for some causative link between the, that, those criteria and the ease of, ease of retrieval. So again, in, in the 20, 2011 guidance, it talks about the fact that if you have a um, paper filing system, which is just arranged by um, the name of the individual, so there's a file for Martin Sloan, but within that, all the information is just chronological. It's not, it's not divided up by a different topic then according to that guidance, that's probably not a relevant filing system because it's not sufficiently organised. And the court looked at that guidance and they looked at the fact that lawyers had, had to look at this and said, well, that, that doesn't satisfy the test. So a, a good decision, I think, if you are an organisation with lots of paper records, this, this seems to narrow the scope of subject access requests. I, I don't know whether at the end of this matter, I mean, that this litigation has gone on for a long time, I, uh, whether uh, the... Uh, beneficiaries may, may appeal on this point. You know, it, it seems to me that the reason that the review was carried out by trained lawyers is, is that that's what Taylor Westing employs. They have uh, trainees and associates who would be working on that file, who'd be familiar with the file. So it wouldn't make sense to use an administrative person to do that task. That point wasn't really discussed in the court and it'd be interesting to see whether um, there is any further, further litigation on that. But for the time being, it looks like uh, the scope of uh, your responsibilities in relation to paper records um, has narrowed slightly, which is which is a, a good thing. And now I hand over to Grant to take you through the, the next couple of slides. Morning, everyone. Um, I want to talk a little bit about standard contractual clauses. So this is dealing with international data transfers, and most of you will be aware that um, standard contractual clauses, so these are European uh, Commission blessed contractual mechanisms are used by many to uh, provide adequate safeguards to transfer data outside the EU to countries where there is no finding of adequacy. So this affects an, a lot of organisations who use these contractual clauses to paper international transfers of data. Uh, Max Schrems who will be known to many as, a, as quite a celebrity now in data protection circles, a lawyer and privacy campaigner. And he complained to the Irish data protection regulator uh, uh, to challenge the transfer of his data by Facebook in Ireland to Facebook in the US. And Facebook justified those transfers on the basis that they were using standard contractual clauses. Now, Max Schrems' uh, complaint was on the basis that those contractual clauses provided no protection against access to that data from the US intelligence services and he had no effective legal address in the US if they did that and that was contrary to his rights under the European Charter of Fundamental Rights which uh, guarantee a right to respect for his privacy in relation to his family home and communications. So he was saying these, the, these contractual provisions offer no protection at all against um, effectively the intelligence services in the US uh, accessing that data. 
Um, the Data Protection Commission in Ireland uh, decision was then referenced up to the High Court, and the Irish High Court then referred 11 questions for a preliminary he hearing by the European Court of Justice before it could make a determination on the issue. So, um, so that reference was made, and as is normal, the Advocate General who advises the court issued an opinion on uh, the issues for the court's benefit. Now, this is not the court decision. We await the court's decision. But it, generally, the, the court does take, in most cases, does take the advice of the Advocate General, but not always. So what did the Advocate General actually say? Well, the Advocate General's view was that um, contractual clauses, so the safeguard mechanism in Article 46, of GDPR and the ability for the European Commission to issue a, a, a decision blessing contractual clauses was in clearly intended to apply in the case for use in, for countries that, for which there is no adequacy decision. Because if there is an adequacy decision, then you would, you would rely on that. There'd be no need to put those contractual mechanisms in place. So the fact that actually the regime, the US or any other country, doesn't have an adequacy decision, shouldn't preclude the use of the contractual conditions, otherwise there would be no point to them. But what the Advocate General went on to say, so firstly, uh, he felt the decision that blessed these conditions was not invalid. So the decision itself was, was a valid one, which is, would be good news for those who used them. But what he went on to say was, that actually in terms of the compatibility with the charter, it depends on the ability of the actual controllers, so the organizations that are exporting the data to uh, ensure that if the terms of the contracts were not being adhered to, because it was impossible given the local uh, legal environment to do so, then the transfer should be suspended. And if the controller didn't suspend the transfer, then the local supervisory authority, i.e. the Irish Data Protection Commissioner, could order that the transfers be suspended. So the Advocate General's position is that the standard contractual clauses themselves are valid, uh, but they actually only provide adequate safeguards if their terms are actually enforced and are used properly. And if it becomes apparent to the data exporter or indeed to the importer, that they can't comply with the contractual clauses because of the local legal environment, then actually they should suspend the transfer. And if they don't, then the supervisory should do, authority should do so too. Now, that means, I think, that actually there will be, if that is correct, and if that's what the court agrees with, then there will be quite a, a, an onus on those using those clauses to actually carry out um, an assessment as to whether or not the country to which they're exporting the data using these clauses will actually, whether the regime there will allow them to actually comply with those contractual obligations. So that could be quite a, an onerous um, thing for organizations to do. And it may encourage, I think, organizations to perhaps localize data and make sure that um, they're only using these contractual clauses and only exporting data when they actually have to. So the next decision I wanted to talk about is an old favorite for those who tune into these sessions and who've been coming to our sessions for some time. So this is a UK decision. So this is in the case of Morrison Supermarkets and it's all about vicarious liability. So vicarious liability, it's a common law concept and that's where someone is responsible for the wrongs committed by, some, by somebody else, generally because of the relationship that they have with that person. And the liability is kind of strict, no fault, and indirect. So in the case of this case, this is about the relationship between an employer and an employee, and whether the employer was vicariously, indirectly liable for the actions of that employee. Uh, the facts here were that in 2013, an internal auditor, a guy called Skelton, was employed by Morrison's and he was tasked with transferring payroll data to Morrison's external auditor, which is a big four firm. 
And he had done that before, and this was in the context of his usual job role. But he was clearly aggrieved at what had been going on in terms of his relationship with Morrison's, and he took the opportunity when he had the information to make a copy of it, which he then posted online. Um, to cut a long story short, he was caught and he was sentenced to eight years in prison for what he had done. And he did admit that what he did, he did to punish Morrison's because he was unhappy with the way he'd been previously treated. 5,000 employees then brought a class action against Morrison's, claiming that either Morrison's were directly liable for what had happened, i.e. they had breached their obligations under the Data Protection Act, or if they hadn't, then they had vicarious liability for the actions of Skelton because they were indirectly liable for what he did uh, because they, he had been an employee acting in the course of his employment. So just to recap, the High Court and the Court of Appeal, High Court said, no, you're not directly liable for what happened, Morrison's, because you couldn't have anticipated what had happened or taken steps to prevent its disclosure. However, you are vicariously liable for the actions of your employee because he was acting in the course of his employment. He'd been given that information because he was an auditor. He was authorized to disclose it to the big four um, accountancy firm. And actually, this was the field of activities in which had been assigned to him. And therefore, the disclosure of that information on the internet was part of a, a continuous sequence of events that had started with the information being disclosed to him. So what did the Supreme Court say? The Supreme Court said that the lower courts had actually got this wrong. And what they should have done is they should have looked at whether or not the wrongful conduct was so closely connected with the acts that Skelton was authorized to do that actually he was acting in the ordinary course of his employment. So the breach was the posting of the data online, and that was not part of his job role, nor was it something that he was authorized to do. So his motive was also relevant. It was clear that what he was doing was acting in a way that was trying to damage the supermarket. He was not acting in his employer's business. And the fact that there was a direct link between the disclosure of the information to him and his posting it online was not sufficient to fix Morrison's with vicarious liability for his actions. However, what the Supreme Court did say was the Data Protection Act did not exclude the possibility that an employer could be vicariously liable for the acts of an employee, but it can only arise on the appro appropriate facts, which in this case it didn't. So in terms of views on this, clearly uh, it's a big decision for employers. It is good news for employers. I think most of us felt slightly surprised when the High Court originally said that Morrison's was vicariously liable for the actions of Skelton. But I think there's a number of notes of caution that should be uh, rung here. Firstly, employers can be vicariously liable for employee actions on the right facts. But don't forget about direct liability. Um, I think probably now, if this case was litigated again, maybe the High Court would say, actually, you, Morrisons, could have done more to prevent that employee being able to put um, that data out on the web. As technology moves on, the onus to show that you're keeping pace with technological developments and the safeguards that you could put in place to stop this sort of thing happening continues to move as well. So taking appropriate steps to implement necessary security measures, I think is uh, important. So, and again, I think also it may depend on the employee's role. If that employee had perhaps been involved in terms of PR or comms and had inadvertently put out information that shouldn't have been put out, I can see a decision going the other way. I can see that the courts might hold rightly that the employer was vicariously liable for what had happened. So, um, moving on to recent ICO developments, there are a number of things, and it is really important, I think, to stress the ICO is consistently and, and pretty much on a continuous basis issuing some for, form of com either on Twitter or on the website, and it is important to keep tabs on what's going on. I've just pulled out here 
uh, five or so things that I think are, are, are just worth highlighting for people so that they know that they're on the horizon. The first is the age appropriate design code. So this is guidance to help organizations to ensure that when they're processing children's data, uh, they remain compliant with GDPR in the connection with online services and platforms. This doesn't just apply to online services that are specifically directed at children. It will apply if children are likely to use the products or services that are, are made available. And what the age appropriate design code does is it sets out basically 15 standards that the ICO expects organizations to adhere to. And it is all, you will not be surprised to hear, it all are, are revolves around what is in the best interests of children. So definitely worth looking at. The design code is in final form. It has not yet been laid before Parliament, so it has not yet been kind of formally adopted, but we expect that it will be at some point during the course of this year. And you have 12 months to implement uh, once it has come in, but it, it will require, I think, a lot of organizations to do quite a bit of work. So definitely something to be looking at now and preparing for. Second thing I wanted to highlight was the direct marketing code. So this is still in draft. There was a consultation exercise started in January, finished in early March. I suspect the ICO at the moment is probably not spending too much time on this, given all the other things that are in front of it, but it is coming down the track. And it is quite a substantial rewrite of the previous codes that have been written. And it's really an update to cover GDPR. So it covers things like consent, transparency, accountability, the use of DPIAs in direct marketing, and it also offers some valuable guidance in relation to new technology, you know, things like social media, digital marketing, advertising, apps and games advertising. So definitely worth looking at, but at the moment still out in draft. Third thing I've lumped the two together, although they are different, these are all about um, provisions in GDPR that are about trying to encourage uh, industry um, uh, standardization of various things. So the codes of conduct, so the ICO has said that they are now in a position to start looking at codes of conduct and certification schemes. So um, in the case of codes of conduct, um, associations or representative bodies who may be looking to develop ICO bless specific guidelines for industry sectors can now engage with the ICO and submit draft codes of conduct, which the ICO will look at. And in relation to certification schemes, there are none uh, as yet, but the ICO is looking to encourage uh, certification bodies and certification criteria so that certification schemes can be put in place. And this is really, I think, intended for uh, processing operations. So for example, the example the ICO gives, for example, maybe online banking operations, something like that, where actually a bank may want to go through a certification process. So they get a certificate to say the GDPR compliant uh, GDPR compliant uh, mission. What they hope is that will build customer trust and loyalty as a result. Slightly differently, we just wanted to highlight uh, for those in the education sector that the ICO has published uh, a blog which says that they've reprimanded a couple of primary schools for effectively publishing uh, photographs of uh, classrooms, so children in classroom, in effectively ignoring the wishes of parents. So parents have said, we do not want our children's photographs to be used outside the school environment. And I think this has been in the context of adoptive parents who obviously got safeguarding issues. And so there's a note of caution there for schools to make sure that they have appropriate procedures in place so that if actually the parents have indicated their wishes regarding uses of uh, images of their children, then those wishes are adhered to. And the final thing, just you, you may remember Cambridge Analytica, the ICO issued a fine, the maximum fine of £500,000 uh, to Facebook in connection with its use of data in relation to uh, interference in the political process. Um, 
Facebook uh, appealed that decision and they appealed it alleging, I think, that the ICO had got its procedures wrong and had also there were issues of bias, et cetera, that had been that had been leveled. Now that case was actually settled. Facebook agreed to pay the five hundred thousand pounds, but on a no liability basis. It would have been interesting to see because clearly there are a number of monetary penalty, large monetary penalty notices coming down the track. It would have been interesting to see how that case had actually evolved, but it has been settled. But I suspect other organisations will be looking very closely at how the ICO is handling fines, given the size of some of the fines that are coming down the track in under GDPR. So that's all I wanted to say. I will now hand back to Martin. Thanks, Grant. So I'm going to just take you through um, uh, three decisions from uh, national uh, data protection regulators of the ICO and two others uh, within Europe, which I think are uh, worth highlighting. So the first one, we're going to Belgium on our, our tour around Europe. Um, and this is a really interesting one. It's just in the last week or so. And it's to do with who you can appoint as your data protection officer. And I, I know from speaking to a lot of clients over the last few years, you know, that who you appoint as your DPO is, is a big challenge, particularly if you are a small organization, you've got a limited number of people, but also within larger organizations and where there's a concern that if you appoint someone who is not in a, um, who's perhaps in a more junior role, they won't have the sufficient political clout within the organization to actually do, do the job. So this one here that involves an organization which had appointed their head of compliance risk and audit as their DPO. And the Belgian data protection regulator said, no, you, you can't do that. That is not um, appropriate. Um, so they've issued a fine of 50,000 euros. So GDPR, it's, it's, for those of you who are required to appoint a DPO will, will know, um, sets out what the DPO has to do in terms of their experience and their, their uh, knowledge. And it says that they, they can take other take on other tasks and roles so you can combine being a DPO with something else. But they've got to be able to do that in a way that is means they can perform their role as a DPO free of conflict in an independent manner because the, the purpose of the DPO is to be there to effectively keep an eye on things from a data protection perspective, to flag up issues, to to almost sit in the in the shoes of the data subjects and raise issues and, and deal with them as required to deal with the, the regulator. And it, it is a role which GDPR contemplates may from time to time lead to the DPO saying that things have to be done in a way that is not necessarily in the interests of the, the controller itself. So what went wrong here? Well, the, 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 the Belgian uh, regulator said appointments incompatible because the DPO has uh, decision making powers in relation to uh, employee dismissal, um, which could um, conflict with its duties. And it picks up there in particular in the fact that it needs to be a confidential advisor in relation to um, data protection related matters as well. And I think that the biggest issue here is you know, around combining the role of head of compliance, risk and audit uh, with being a DPO. There's a, a, you know, a clear, clear conflict there because the DPO then doesn't have independent oversight of the, the operations that are taking place within those departments. So there are judgments that you might make as head of compliance and risk um, where you take a particular decision to do something within an organization, but you may take those for a reason, for various reasons. And you may, you know, you may take a view in terms of a, a data protection compliance issue where actually on balance you've decided to take that risk for other factors. And by combining these two roles together, what the Belgian regulator is saying is that actually that creates a conflict because the DPO is then not able to do do his his or her job properly. They lose that independent oversight, um, and they won't be able to carry out their role properly. Effectively, they are potentially policing their own homework in, in several areas. And they also the the other interesting point in this is they, they flag up the the, uh, the requirement under Article Thirty Eight Five. Um, which is that the DPO should be bound by secrecy or confidentiality when performing their role. And again, they, they, they are concerned about merging the role of the DPO with other functions, which means that um, that th those confidentiality um, obligations may, may not be effective because effectively you've got someone wearing two hats and therefore you're not properly able to um, ring fence or, or silo the information that the person is aware of so it's a quite quite an interesting it's, it's fairly fairly hot off the press um but i think it may require um 
you know, it may need some organizations looking at who they've gone to the DPO and whether actually they are able to properly maintain um, the, the, that person keeping keeping two hats and uh, not, not getting into a position of conflict. The next decision, we, we go to Germany. Um, so this one involved a, a large corporate landlord and um, let out a lot of residential properties. And they were fined uh, by the, the Berlin Data Protection Authority um, just over 14 million euros. And this is all in relation to how long um, data has been retained for. So the data retention principle. And as you'll all know, the, the requirement under, under GDPR is that you don't keep uh, personal data for longer than necessary, or you don't keep it in a form that permits identification for longer than necessary. And there's a bit of a backstory to this. So the, 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 the Berlin DPA had, had investigated uh, the, the control of systems and they'd found them to be non-compliant and they'd made various recommendations about fixing this. Basically, what, 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 what was going on here is that um, the, the controller had a, a legacy system, which as many old systems do, just archives a whole load of data and there's no way of effectively deleting or getting rid of that data. And this was some fairly fairly sensitive stuff. There was financial information, there was pay slips, there was employment details, bank details, um, social security information as well. And so the I say the, the DPA took uh, made some recommendations that wasn't followed up on, um, and as a result of that, they issued a fine for I say just over 14, 14 million euros, so a fairly a fairly chunky fine. Key takeaways from this, um, look at your legacy technology. I, I know when organizations were preparing for GDPR, this, this was identified by a lot of people as, as a, a hotspot, you've got old systems, but you're not able to actually manage your data in a way that allows you to comply with GDPR because you can't delete it, you can't get rid of it. And the cost of improving or replacing those systems was just too great. So I, I think the important thing here is, you know, if you do have systems like that and you are aware of issues, then, have a plan as to how you're going to deal with that so if you are questioned you can say well you know this is our plan for replacing it this is what we're doing about it you know here's why we've not done something so far if you don't have that then then you're going to be very much on the back foot if there is a complaint to, to the regulator but also you know look at your data retention policies ensure that those are properly documented um, and that they're actually being implemented and carry out regular regular checks of your systems and, and audits so if you have a, a data retention policy, it, you know, are you actually complying with it? Um, are your systems configured to do that? Uh, try and pick up on, on any areas of, of non-compliance and, and work out how, how you fix those. And the, the last case I want to talk about is um, in the UK. So this is the one involving Dixon's, um, uh, which is you know, PC World um, and Curry's. Um, and this goes back to our uh, hack that uh, they suffered uh, um, back in 2017-2018. Now it, it's fair to say that um, DSG has has some form here um, in terms of uh, instance like this and I think you know, that, that was clearly an aggravating factor when the, the Information Commission was looking at it but uh, the, the details of this one don't, don't make for, for good reading. So th the issue here was that uh, malware was installed on the point of sale terminals in, in about um, in, in Dixon stores so that was about 5,000 devices within various branches of PC World and Curry's and Dixon's Travel. And over the course of that, just under a year, um, the, the attacker was able to collect information on about 6 million payment cards and about 14 million people um, from internal servers. So the, the, I'm not going to dwell on the actual monetary fine here because this was under the under the 98 Act and therefore the um, maximum fine was £500,000. But it is worth picking up, you know, there, were, there were some serious issues here. So uh, Dixon's wasn't complying with PCI DSS, which is the, the card scheme guidance for, uh, sorry, rules for handling um, card card data. They hadn't applied um, Microsoft guidance on, on patching known vulnerabilities. So a lot of the faults here were known about, but they hadn't done anything about this. They were using software that was, in some cases, eight years old um, and severely outdated. And perhaps worst of all, they, they had had a, a security audit which had picked up some of these issues in May 2017, but they hadn't done anything about it. So no, no surprises that a maximum fine was issued here. Um, but I think it does highlight the importance of ensuring that you, know, you keep your security patching up to date, you're regularly testing your, your security, you're looking at whether systems are now outdated. You know, I mentioned before around um, the uh, data retention issues. You know, just make sure that your your technology is is up to date, and and think about what what you can do about that. 
um, keep it under review and uh, just, just ensure you're, you're applying best practice. Okay, so that um, takes to that. Uh, the last slide here is just um, looking into the future, um, conscious of time, and we, we do have a couple of questions in. So um, I'm not going to dwell too much on, on the horizon other than say your know, Brexit is, come, is um, on the horizon. Um, we still don't know whether there'll be an adequacy decision for, for the UK. Um, so it may need to dust down your, your no deal preparation um, later in the year. We'll hopefully have a clear review as to what's happening um, at the end of the transition period. Uh, later, later in the summer, but to keep an eye on that. Um, the other one, just to flag, um, is around the privacy regulation. So we still don't have a new text for that. Um, things kind of fell apart at the end of last year in terms of trying to reach political agreement. There, there's no clear guidance on what's what's happening um, with that uh, and and how that will move forward. But it, it may well be that that ends up being a post. Um, Brexit text, um, in which case we, it remains to be seen to what extent that will that will apply in the UK. Okay, um, so I think we, we move on to questions. Martin, there's a. Uh, could you just clarify what a just in time notice is? We've had a question just to clarify that. Yes, yeah, so, so so this is um, you you will have a, a, a worker privacy notice which sets out what you do with your um, your employees' data. Um, but sometimes it's helpful rather than having just one very long privacy notice, you actually um, have a more uh, sort of granular approach and you provide uh, a short notice that covers a particular activity just at the point when the individual needs to know about that. So in this case, you might want a mini privacy notice that just explains to individuals who are taking part in the testing how their data will be used rather than just pointing them to your, your standard notice, um, which where that information sits amongst everything else, you know, a short form notice um, made available when they when, when the processing actually takes place. And there's a question on the Schrems decision that I talked about. Does it make sense to put in a warranty of representation on the third country counterparties, saying that they will be able to comply? And is there any country analysis which indicates which countries generally struggle to comply with uh, standard uh, contractual clauses? Um, I think under the the standard clauses themselves, there's an obligation on importers to uh, identify if they are going to have a problem with complying. The, the problem for me, it's certainly from my experience of these things, is often that importers will sign up to these standard contractual clauses without really understanding what they mean or what union law actually requires of them. So in part, I would suggest that for exporters, there will be an education process and making sure that many of the people to whom they export data actually understand what the, stra the standard contractual conditions actually mean and require of them. Having a representation of warranty, some contractual protection may encourage them to actually get more clued up as to what they sign up to. So yes, I would certainly encourage that. In terms of any country analysis, I don't think there is any official, um, almost like gray, grey list of countries that will will be fine in those that won't. I think that may, may develop. If the Advocate General's opinion holds, then I think what you're going to see is you're going to see an awful lot more complaints coming from individuals to supervisory authorities saying they're not happy that organisations are using these conditions to transfer data to countries and that will involve supervisory authorities getting much more involved. And I think as a result of that, we may start getting a supervisory authority view about particular countries. And that may then ultimately result in some form of country by country analysis or list coming out that people will have cognizance to when they actually decide whether or not they can use these clauses to paper transfers to these countries. So I think that would be my view on that one. I think that's all, all the questions we have. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, contact details are there for, for me and for Grant. Please do get in touch if you've got any, any follow-up questions. But I uh, hope you find this useful. And thanks again for your, your time. Thank you.